Carissa, thank you so much for joining me on the pregnancy, birth and recovery and sharing your story. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. So could you start off with a little quick introduction to those who don't know who you are? Um, (laughs) My name's Carissa. Um, I'm a first-time mum to a a six-and-a-half-year-old boy. Um, We were trying for a baby, my husband and myself, for almost two years. Um, We did have a few early losses in pregnancies and then we did see a fertility specialist and we were very fortunate it took two rounds of Clomid before we did um, conceive. And then um, basically, Amazing. yeah, it was it was really good. Um, had a had a pregnancy. <laughs> I had um, gestational diabetes. I did test really early to that at, I think, 18 weeks. Um, and basically I did not enjoy pregnancy at all. <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, no. Yeah. Right. I had the glow. I had the glow, but I'm pretty sure it was just from throwing up constantly every single day and every single night. But yeah, (laughs) worth it in the end. (laughs) I do want to ask you more about that. Um, But Mm -hmm. before, I'd love to know, at what stage, how long did it take from deciding with your husband, okay, let's go, let's try this, to actually conceiving with your, um, your baby that you've had now? So we were married... February 21, I think it was. Um, and we basically, we weren't trying before the wedding, but we weren't not trying. Um, and then we were, I guess, actively trying after the wedding. And then, yeah, it took a few goes. <laughs> um, and I think, yeah, all up it was a year and a half or two years, one of them. And after the first year, basically, we talked to the doctor and she was just like, look, you've been trying for this amount of time now. Here's a referral for a specialist and choose who you want. Um, and that's where I got stuck in, I guess, all of those fertility Facebook groups, which were very helpful, um, but so overwhelming with advice and suggestions and recommendations. And we did end up going with a Dr. Keong who was really good. Some people either like him or don't like him. He's just, to me, I find direct, straight to the point, and there's no kind of mucking around. It's like you go into your meeting and you're out um, and there's no sugarcoating, which was good. <laughs> so going into that meeting, how are you feeling, considering you'd had two early losses and you'd been trying for a couple of years? Like what was what was happening? I Before we tried, I kind of knew we were – going to have issues I just knew it was something that we were going to struggle with um in the past I've had two let's procedures um which was one was a high grade I think it was sin three and then the second one was sin two um which basically is abnormal cell growth on my cervix so I've got scar tissue on my cervix from that and I was basically at the time when I had those surgeries one of the questions that the doctors asked was do you want to have children because if you don't, we can do a hysterectomy. And I was like, whoa, I'm early 20s, not now, but I don't know what future me wants. Um, So fast forward to when my husband and myself were trying, I always kind of knew something was going to be a struggle there. Um, Didn't exactly know 100% what. um, And still to this day, don't really know what the issue was. I think it was more so on my side than my husband's because he had all the tests and everything. He had some abnormalities which were still in the normal range um but then mine was I had a low grade of PCOS and obviously the scar tissue um but Dr Keong just wasn't really concerned about it so yeah I mean I was I guess kind of relieved to get to that stage but then at the same time it was a bit also overwhelming not having an answer of this is exactly why you're having issues (laughs) Mm. Okay. So when you first saw the specialist, what sort of tests did you have to undergo? Oh, um, to be honest, I can't remember all of them now. There was blood groups that we had to check. Um, then I think they were really basic ones. It was just to let, check your hormone levels, um, I think vaccination levels as well, like to see how much of your vaccines you had left in you. 
<laughs> um, and then my husband had to do it, the same ones as well. I did have an ultrasound um, just so he could, I guess, see in that area. Um, didn't, like I said, we did a colposcopy, but I don't think we did. Um, he did check around that area. Um, and, yeah, just because I think those tests all came back pretty in the normal-ish range, so there wasn't too much testing needed for us. Yeah. And then what did he recommend? He recommended the, did he go straight to the Clomid? Yes. So it was Clomid as a first recommendation for three cycles. Um, But he also, at the start, because of the age we were, and he asked, do we want to have, like, how many kids do we want? And we were like, look, one is great. Two would be good if we could. And we had the option. And then because of our age, at the time I was must have been just 30, um, and he was like, okay, well, for that timeline, we kind of need to go a bit faster. <laughs> so he only wanted us to be clomid for three rounds, which was a maximum of six months. Um, my cycles were, I think I could get to 40, no, I might have been 50, 53 days for my cycles, so they were just kind of like really abnormal. Um, and then after that, he wanted to try IUI, I think it is, and then it was IVF but we didn't have to go down those routes at all, which was really good. Okay. You found out you're pregnant. How did you find it out? So basically with Clomid, um, you take the tablet, I think at the start of your first day of your period, um, and then technically you should be ovulating 14 days, like a regular cycle after that. Um but sorry, hey Baba, it's okay. Um, but with mine, I went in for the fourteen day blood test and a scan, and I didn't have many follicles that had dropped yet, so the egg basically hadn't gone to the stage where it needed to go. Um, so we were told not to have sex yet, um, because that's basically what they do. They find out how many follicles have dropped, how many eggs are kind of ready. Um, and then they advise a day to have sex. <laughs> um, so you can't sorry. have sex a day before? Well, you can. Oh, you, you can. can. It just but, won't be effective. Just, yeah, like, okay. Yeah, this is not yeah, the okay. day to try yet kind of thing. <laughs> not for conceiving, um, right. Yeah. <laughs> so there was no purpose for them behind it other than. <laughs> no purpose women. at all. <laughs> um, so I think for that cycle, it, I think I got to 29 or 32 days before I was starting to ovulate. So it was still quite long. Um, and this is where we were really thankful that we went to the specialist that we did because I've had sister, like my sisters both had to go to specialists as well. They were basically just given Clomid and told on day 14, do it and you'll get pregnant. Whereas if we did that, it would have never worked for us. Um, so I think it was like every three days after day 14, I had to go back to the specialist, get the blood test, get the ultrasound. And then finally they'd seen that two follicles, I think it was, had dropped and he's like okay so you can have sex on this day this day and this day and we'll go from there and then basically after they tell you that they say to take a test I think it's two weeks later they give you the exact date to take the test um at that stage I was crazy with taking tests I was just like obsessed and addicted to it um and basically a week after we can I leave, can yes. I ask, what does that mean for you? How many tests were you doing every day or I, how often? I, like, looking back on it now, it was like I really was addicted to the trying to conceive journey. But I had bulk bought all these little tiny tests that you can get from eBay and it got to the stage where a week after us having sex all the time, I would, every time I go to the toilet, take a test, take another test. Like, I was just over the top. Um and it was like a part of me was just like, no, 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 we have to do it. We have to know. And I would squint so much at these tests. I'd put them in different lights. I'd take a photo and, you know, invert the colours and be like, oh, my gosh, I can see something. And I'm like, oh, no, that's like a the dye leaking. And it was never like <laughs> they were never positives except for the ones like the three that we had that were. Um, but, yeah, so seven days after we did it, which was not the time I was meant to take the test. <laughs> I did take the test and it was a faint but obvious line. And so I was like, I'm not going to tell my husband because he's just going to be like, Carissa, you shouldn't be taking this right now. Um, And then the next day I took probably two tests and they were getting significantly darker. 
And so I was like, okay, this is this is something now. So I showed my husband and he's like, okay, well, we're not getting too excited just yet just because of everything that happened in the past. Um, but then it got to, I think I was meant to email the fertility specialist on the Monday and I got to the Friday and I was like, hey, I couldn't remember what day I was meant to take the test. <laughs> but here's my test. And she's like, well, that looks really promising. So come in and we'll test your HCG, I think it is. Um, so I did that. and. Basically, uh, the HCG was more than doubling and then my progesterone was dropping, which is potentially what had happened in the past pregnancies where the progesterone just declined quite rapidly and lost the pregnancy. Um, So they got me on progesterone suppositories, I think that's the word, um, basically. (laughs) And um, the HCG was still more than doubling, which... At the time, we were a bit nervous about because with Coimbridge, you have a higher chance of multiples. <laughs> and then we did have the two follicles that dropped, but we only had one. <laughs> um, and then uh, my progesterone, once I started taking it, was fine. And then I think I took it until 35 weeks of the pregnancy, which was very messy, <laughs> but good. <laughs> messy, you mean with the suppositories? Yeah, just I was wearing period underwear literally every single day of my pregnancy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you're pregnant. It worked. It did. <laughs> <laughs> and you mentioned you started to feel unwell. Yeah. <laughs> At what stage did that kick in? I celebrated too early because I was reading that morning sickness can kick in around I think five weeks and then peak bit at eight weeks I got to close to nine weeks and I was like no nope, no symptoms I'm fine I'm great and then I literally got smacked to the face mm-hmm. with morning sickness or day sickness and literally probably five times a day minimum I'd be throwing up I had spew bags in my car in my bag um I was very lucky in working from home and working for myself but if I was working a regular job I think it would have gotten to the stage where our boss would have probably had that discussion and said, hey, you need to step back (laughs) because I would have been probably sick four out of five days of the week. Um, Yeah, so I was on uh, on Dancitron, Pramen, Ginger, and it still just wasn't, you know, (laughs) doing the right thing. I just felt hungover is probably the best way of explaining it. You know, when you're just hungover and you're at the stage of just dry reaching constantly, that was me, but like 24-7 and to the stage I couldn't remember what it was like feeling normal (laughs) yeah how was your mental health like how are you feeling in that stage it's weird because at the stage it was the longest time of my life like that pregnancy was so long and I was like look I can't do this again like I physically won't be able to do it again if I have baby and then go through it again Now, looking back on it, I can't remember just how bad I felt. Like, I know I felt horrible and I know I was I was struggling. Um, There were definitely days where I'd just be on the couch crying and feeling sorry for myself, especially it was hard before I could feel bub kicking and moving around because it was kind of feeling like I was just sick to be sick. But I think once he started moving and I could feel him and I kind of got the bond then, that made it a little bit more bearable to get through. Mm. And that, how many weeks were you then, did you say, around 20? I think we had the first kick around. It was very close to when I tested for um, gestational diabetes, yeah. so it would have been like 18, 19 weeks. We did feel the little water kicks. <laughs> so just when you're starting to feel... <laughs> Better from that, you then tested positive. I get <laughs> And how were you yeah. feeling when oh. you were diagnosed with that? I knew I was going to get it. My Orma, she has type 2 diabetes, and my sister had gestational diabetes for both of her pregnancies. So I was kind of just like, it's going to happen. Like, it's just going to happen for me. And then that's why I was tested quite early. Um, my doctor did want me at 16 weeks, but I had to postpone it for two weeks just because how I. <laughs> and then um yeah when it came back as positive I cried I cried a lot um yeah Baba. <laughs> um and it's such a like having gestational diabetes is such an overwhelming experience because you can be waiting for that first appointment 
for some people I think wait up to a month and you just don't know what you're meant to eat and you don't know what you're meant to do and it's like you're thinking low carbs low everything like no sugar no this but in actual fact it's you're meant to be pairing foods correctly like you have your carbs you have your healthy Mm -hmm. fats and Oh, I felt like I was just starving in that. I think I was a week before I had the appointment, but I was like, oh, I'm so bare. <laughs> like, I'm so hungry. And you probably would have been hungry too, considering you'd been unwell and, the, um, you know, yeah, feeling unwell for the previous four months. Yeah, just throwing up constantly. <laughs> mm, okay. So you waited a week, two weeks to see a dietitian, was it, or the doctor? It was just the the hospital has like oh, it was just a program for gestational diabetes. So everyone who was there was pregnant with gestational diabetes. Um, and then I didn't see an endocrinologist until hey Baba, here we go. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, your mama. Oh. Um, yeah, so I didn't see an endocrinologist until I think I was 30 weeks at that stage. Um, and it was purely just because my numbers started spiking because I was diet controlled the whole time. Um, and then it was getting to the stage where it was like, oh, maybe I do need insulin or the medication. Um, but he was just, he was fine with it in the end and was just saying that I needed to be a bit smarter with some of my food. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. And out of interest, did you use exercise to help control the diabetes at all I tried to at the start um uh, basically like this is at the start before the appointments kind of thing I would be walking laps of my hallway um trying to get levels down because I just didn't know what I should be eating and all that um but I felt sick like I was that nighttime mm. was probably the worst for my sickness <laughs> and basically mostly they probably an hour after every meal, I would be most of the time throwing up majority of what I ate. So, yeah, yeah, like I tried to do the exercise bit, but then in the end it was just eat what you can kind of thing in small amounts and, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and a that's, lot of a really, <laughs> that's a really yeah. tough um, combination that you had with the gestational yeah. diabetes and then feeling unwell. Ah, it was worth it. It was, yeah, sucky at the time and probably couldn't think of anything worse. But then at the moment now I'm like, yeah, it was worth it. I, I yeah. mindset changed. And I'm like, I'd do it again. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So at what stage did you start to think, okay, I'm actually going to have a baby. I need to perhaps think about childbirth. Did Did you ever, did that ever <sighs> thought ever come to your mind? Not really. I always had in my mind my plan of how I wanted to have a baby and the labor plan it didn't go to that plan at all um but then at before having a baby I was in my mind I'm like I'm not having a cesarean I want to go natural I want to do this I want to do that I want to have a water birth but when I got pregnant like it's crazy how much that just didn't matter in the end I was like oh well you know I'm gonna listen to the professionals they're gonna know what's best for me I mean I can have my own wants but if at the end of the day they're like, actually, it's safer for your baby. Like I, it was crazy how much my mindset had gone from myself to him. Um, so in the end, we did have to be induced, um, which I had to leave quite a few Facebook groups for this because when you talk about induction on them, um, they're very negative and they're very do your own research, fight against this. You know, you've got your own choice and your own way of going for your birth, and. Um, that like when I started reading it was making me feel guilty and I'm being like, well, maybe I should, shouldn't be doing it. I'm like, no, this is a professional. They know what's best for baby. I don't care about my birth plan right now. Like let's do what's best for him. So I stepped away from groups. I, you know, was kind of every time someone's like, oh, do you know when you're having your baby? I'm like, yep, being induced and we're happy with that decision. So I felt like I had to kind of still, you know, defend Just my own. Yeah. And justify like, we're doing this. <laughs> Don't say anything back to us. <laughs> did you get any kickback or was that, did anyone say anything or was it more? Not, the- not people that we knew personally. Um, uh, I didn't let it be known to my social media at all just because I was worried about the backlash and I'm like, look, I need to protect myself right now. Um, and the only place that I did share it was on a gestational diabetes Facebook group. 
and everyone was just like, that's bad, don't do it, like it's so bad for your child. And I'm just like, okay, but he's going to be 38 weeks and we're doing it because he's having reduced movements, which at the end of the day, my priority is getting him out two weeks earlier than being like, oh, he's not moving for two days straight. <laughs> like, Yeah. And so once you'd expressed, once you'd, you'd talked about it in the Facebook group and you received those comments, what, what did you do? Like did you, did you say anything <laughs> to them or did you just <laughs> ignore? <laughs> I Googled um, and, you know, I went to Google Scholar and I was like, okay, there's no actual real scientific evidence basing and going and backing up all of these statements. These are more so blog posts that they're reading which is fine, like people can read that, but I was like I'm more evidence-based here mm-hmm. and um, I was just like, okay, I'm not even going to bother fighting back to these people, like it's not worth the drama that it's going to cause. Like they're, mm-hmm. they've got their, you know, thoughts and um, beliefs and I've got mine and this is what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. And for those who are listening that perhaps want some more information, I will link an episode that I did with Dr. an obstetrician, Dr. Cara Thompson, who talks about induction of birth, and it was a fabulous episode. So um, I'll put the link in the show notes. Okay, so you take to Google. You're happy with your decision to have an induction. Did Was there anything else you did in the, the, the days and the weeks leading up to birth? Um. We were meant to do the the perineal, is that the massage? Perineal massage. Oh, oh God, that was like the most uncomfortable thing ever. And I'm like, okay, it's not worth it. So I didn't do that. Um, I had, a, oh, my gosh, what's the tea? Is it rose something tea or? Rose uh, hip. Um, is, is it rose hip tea? I know there's something that's meant to like soften the cervix or whatever. Oh, I can't even think of what it's called. I think it is that. Rose hip. Yes, it is rose yeah. hip. Yeah, so I took some of that um, and then basically I don't know if that worked or Bob was just ready to come out anyway because my I had a bulge right near the top of my area where that was his head. So his head was super low. Um, I was doing that typical pregnant walk where I'm like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, and then the Thursday before our, or the Thursday with the last appointment with our obstetrician, um, where we did say we we're going to induce. She basically did a check and she's like, oh, well, you're one centimetre dilated already. Um, so she's like, that could stay like that for a couple of weeks or it could mean that things are progressing. Um, so originally I think we were booked in for the 27th of April for the induction, but then we did move it forward because that weekend after the obstetrician appointment on the Thursday, Friday and Saturday, there was like very little movements from Bub. Um, so we moved it forward to the 24th, which might have been a Monday, might have been that next day. So, yeah, it all proceeded quite quickly there. Um, but then because I was already dilated, we didn't need to take, I think there's like a, med- a pill that they do to soften the cervix and make that move forward a bit. So it was just went to the hospital, had the oxytocin drip, I think it is, and then I had my waters manually broken and, Seven and a half hours later, Bob was there. <laughs> was it that quick? <clears throat> okay, it was so quick. <laughs> so you get ready, you drive in the morning yep. to the hospital. How was that yep. drive in? I was exhausted. Um, so we obviously knew that we were coming to the hospital the next day. Um, so we're like, okay, you know, giving birth, let's have an early night rest, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. My husband was very tired the night before, so he spent the whole night snoring. And I basically got three hours sleep if I was lucky. Um, so we got to the hospital at 6.30 and I'm like, buggered, I was dead. <laughs> and then um, I think the obstetrician came in at 7.30 just to, she, I think she gave me the drip first, possibly. I can't even remember which came first, the breaking of the waters or the drip. Um, but then she left and then the midwives were kind of taking over and originally I was like, oh, I want to go, you know, natural. I want to feel the contractions. I want to actually feel and experience this. I had a TENS machine thinking I'm going to be amazing. Hey, Bubba. And then I might have got the gas here as well. No, I needed that epidural. <laughs> I think that lasted maybe an hour in, um, like, the labour with the contractions starting. <laughs> and I'm like, nah, 
but I didn't know this until the time. Apparently the oxytocin drip, it gives you the contractions full speed so it doesn't slowly bring it up like birth does naturally. And I was just like, oh, this is bad. Um, yeah, so I got the um, epidural. And then with how quickly it was going forward, our obstetrician actually almost missed the birth because she'd gone back to her office to deal with the patients of the day. And then couldn't tell you what time it was, but let's just say it was two o'clock. The midwife has rung. Our obstetrician is like, oh, she's in active labor. Like she's 10 centimeters. We're telling her to push. You need to get here. And then um, my obstetrician works probably right outside of a school. So you got the school zone at two o'clock. And then there was another school zone near our hospital. So she came there, I reckon, two pushes before Bob came out. Like she'd rocked up and then she's like, okay, I'm here, suited up. And then Bob literally just exploded out. (laughs) She just caught the baby. Literally. (laughs) So with the epidural, how much could you feel? Could you feel that transition happen? So... It was a gradual, like, I guess, numbing of that pain. Um, It did get to the stage where my left side, I'm pretty sure it was, my left side, yeah, got really numb to the point where it was kind of coming up. I could feel it coming up to my throat. And when I was swallowing, my throat just felt a little bit weird. So that's when I told the midwife. And then um, that's when she found out well, I was 10 centimetres dilated. But apparently when it goes like that, they need to reduce the amount of the epidural because it could be going into the lungs or something and just doing that stuff. But um, at the same time, not that long before that, I could actually feel the contractions happening and, like, I could tell them when they were happening on that little scanning bit on the piece of paper behind me. And she's like, oh, okay, well, you should be able to feel that. And I'm like, oh, okay. And so that's when they did up the dose again. And then I think everything just kind of went hey well a bit there but not once did I feel worried about it I was just like okay I'm getting a bit too numb (laughs) let's do something about that and then I'm like I can feel the pain now so I had like the epidural and then the gas as well and yeah I think yeah sorry sorry um interrupted you then you keep going no 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 so when the transition occurred could you feel it change like your your sensations in your body change could you feel the urge to push I never got the urge to push ever um I know some people I'm guessing that don't have the epidural like that's just a natural feeling that people get I never got that I was just told okay push okay now stop now push that's I think just how numb it all got um yeah and like it's weird I could feel I could feel pressure and I could feel obviously their movements and everything, but never felt anything else. Mm, okay. And at what in what position did they put you in before they said to start pushing? So laying on the bed and feet up in the stirrups. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, okay. Yep. <laughs> and did they coach you how to push? Can you talk us through the pushing phase? No. It was more. I think actually, no, they might have told me to push like I was pushing out a massive poop. Poo. Yep. <laughs> and then harder. I think that's what they kind of told me. So it was like, give it your all. And it was, yeah. And then I like, I had no idea if I was pushing hard enough or not because I literally couldn't feel anything, but I must have been. There was one stage, the first push, sorry, where I think Bub wasn't in the right condition. So they told me to stop pushing straight away. And they're like, look, he's not happy with that. And then I think we waited two minutes and then they maybe twisted his head around or whatever they did. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, we went again and, yeah, he came out. <laughs> Amazing. How were you feeling when he came out? I, 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 it still didn't feel real. So he'd come out and they went to hand him to me to hold. And I'm not really a baby person, so I haven't held too many babies in my life, like, strangers babies just don't interest me kind of thing or friends babies I'm like oh yeah that's cute (laughs) so I wasn't too experienced in holding a baby and so they've gone to try and hand him to me and all I'm thinking of is I'm gonna drop my baby he's so slimy right now like he's just gonna slide out of my hands and then they ended up just plonking him kind of on my chest and it was just I think it took 
<laughs> probably over a month for it to feel real. Like even after we're like, okay, we're in hospital for five days. Once we go home and we're in our house and we've got this other little human living with us, it'll feel real. But it just felt like we had someone on a holiday in our house that we just had to look after like 24-7. <laughs> mm, mm, and, mm. and did you know he was a little boy when you were pregnant? Yeah, yeah we found out ooh, it might have been 10 or 11 weeks we did do the NIP test um, mm. and we had we had my parents here visiting um, so we told them that we were pregnant and then we did find out the gender but we didn't want to tell them we wanted it just to be my husband and myself that did the little reveal for us and so we did like a little balloon explosion and then had my parents walk out after so they could see the blue sprinkled everywhere <laughs> oh, that's sweet so after the birth you've got this slimy little gorgeous baby on your chest and you're like oh who's this how talk us through like did you feed straight away did it take a while to do the first um, did no. you have to have any stitches I had a one stitch um the midwife thought it was more of a graze but then the obstetrician was like nah just stitch in that we're not gonna have any like <laughs> possible things there so she just gave me one stitch um I think he fed straight away I'm like I don't know if he fed because my milk did not come in until like day three <laughs> I tell you that my boobs when the milk came in oh my gosh um, but he, because of my gestational diabetes, he had to get his glucose levels checked, um, as soon as he was born, just to make sure he was okay. Um, he failed both of his first two glucose tests. He only just failed. He was like, I think it was like a 2.1 and the like lowest is meant to be, I don't know, 1.8 or something. Um, I might be saying that wrong. So don't quote me at all. <laughs> um, so basically what that meant was he then had to be under strict feeding for the first 24 hours yeah. until his levels could um, regulate. Um, so I could choose to breastfeed if I wanted to or we could formula feed him or get donor milk um, just to ensure he was definitely getting what he needed. So my husband and myself made the decision to formula feed him for the first 24 hours or until he was back to the levels. Um, at the time we had no idea what donor milk was like the hospital didn't explain how thorough they get tested and how difficult it is to, not difficult, but how like intense the testing is for, before you can donate your milk. So we were just thinking, oh, it's like those Facebook groups where people have donated their milk and we don't know where it's come from. We don't know the person and all of that. So we're like, okay, let's formula feed straight away. So Bub was formula fed. I think he had to be fed every single hour. I can't tell you how much he had to be fed because I chose not to bottle feed him. I got my husband to do that because I didn't want him to associate me with the bottle. Um, so he was, yeah, I think it was like ended up being, yeah, less, less than a day and then we did breastfeed in the end. Yeah. And did you have to carry on the formula feeding? No. So the only time he was formula fed and the only time he's had formula was in hospital. So his first feeds of life, I think, I don't think he would have got anything out of my boob that time. His first feeds probably was formula fed for however long it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And were you trying to express colostrum at the same time? I tried to express colostrum from 30, I think it was 35 weeks. When I stopped the um, progesterone, I was given the go-ahead to start um, collecting and expressing just because um, they recommended it with gestational just in case something like this happens. In the end, I hated the pressure of putting on myself for trying to get it. It was so difficult. I got less than a meal and I was just spending my nights and my mornings mm -hmm. and my afternoons just putting pressure on myself and I wasn't enjoying the last few weeks of pregnancy. So I just was like, okay, I've given up. Like I'm not doing yeah. it. Like we're fine. Like, you know, we didn't yeah. express colostrum this whole time. <laughs> so, yeah, he had... Less than a meal of colostrum and formula. And how about was there more colostrum once you'd had, once you'd given birth? Um, so really? when my milk came in, um, I was at the stage, I think it was, might have been, might have been day two or day three because I remember sitting in hospital still. We were there for five days and I remember being like, I don't think I can breastfeed because this is so hard and so painful. Um no one told me that when you breastfeed, it then 
creates a kind of oxytocin, which then brings your uterus back to contracting pre-pregnancy. Um, so I was experiencing the same contractions that I felt in labour, but I reckon they were worse than what I felt at the time before having, you know, the painkillers. And so I was like, I can't do this. Like if I'm breastfeeding and this is what I feel like every time, this is too hard. Um, and then finally the midwife's like, no, 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 this is what it is. But then my other thing that I've had basically this whole breastfeeding journey is I have a massive oversupply. Um, in hospital, I would have a feed, not, well, he would have a feed, and I would saturate a bath towel. Like I would have a bath towel wrapped around me and my boob that he wasn't drinking from would just leak so, so much. Um, and I was like, this is messy. Like I'm changing my clothes. I'm changing his clothes. Everything's just wet. <laughs> um, but one thing I regret is not collecting that milk because I didn't know mm. you could collect that milk. <laughs> but, yeah, no, it eventually settled a little bit, but I still got massive oversupply. Um, but then that's where I have donated my milk to a milk bank now that I know what they do. <laughs> oh, wow. And never how is that process of donating? So basically it's a blood test um, just to screen your blood to make sure that you don't have anything that you could pass on potentially through a baby. Um, they ask you a questionnaire like, do you smoke, do you drink? Obviously it's a trust thing there. Um, and then once they get your results for your blood test, they say yay or nay. Um, but then uh, I think it's you start collecting it, they pick it up from you, and then they do more tests on the milk just to make sure it's still safe um for their babies and then they pasteurize or pasteurize the milk and um yeah get rid of all bacteria and everything and I think they yeah they donate it to hospitals I think or yeah and then I don't know the rest of their mm. process <laughs> so they came and picked up the milk from you did they yes so I don't know if it's because the actual milk bank is located on I think it's Brisbane or Gold Coast um, but basically, I just had to have the minimum two litres of the donation um, and, yeah, ring them two up. Litres. Yeah. Two litres. Two <laughs> litres. Oh, you had yeah. two litres of excess milk for your first ever baby yeah. that you're breastfeeding. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, I don't have a freezer stash anymore because I've just accepted, like, we're almost seven months now. Like, I think if my milk started to dry up, I'd be like, okay, let's start rebuilding. But in the end, I think I've donated... I think it's like 24 litres, might be, 24 or 25 litres, but I'm like I like I have no need for it and I was like I can, like it's coming out of me anyway, but what do I do with it? That's incredible. How how much water did you have to drink? Were you just thirsty all the time? What's crazy is I'm no thirstier than I was pre-pregnancy. So, like, I'm, I'm thirsty quite a bit. I've got, like, my water bottle with me constantly. Like, I've literally got my water bottle here. But, like... No thirstier than like prior. Yeah, right. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Now, just to move across, I'd love to know a little bit more about your recovery. Bubs is now six and a half months old. Yeah. How's your physical recovery been? Um, I've been, I think I like between throwing up constantly and having diabetes, I was very fortunate in that the little weight gain that I did get from pregnancy. But at the same time, that was one of the things playing in my mind during pregnancy, <laughs> worried about Bob. Um, so my recovery, like that has been fine at the stitches. Well, the stitch, sorry, was fine. Um, yeah, I don't think I've struggled too much in er any of those areas. Um, my biggest thing was probably my oversupply and I guess the stress that comes with that. Like I did struggle with feeding bub in public. I have avoided it until now just because my letdown would spray someone probably two metres away and I'm just like, okay, let's not do that. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. And how have you felt the adjustment to motherhood? Um, I thought I was doing okay. Um, I got to a stage where I was very obsessed with his sleeping um, to the point where I would stop talking to my husband once we put Bub down to bed. I was like, okay, we have to be quiet because if we wake him, his sleep's going to be disrupted and we're not going to get 
all of this, you know, unbroken sleep. We were quite lucky where he would sleep through the night and was gaining weight quite safely at 10 or 12 weeks. Um, And so we were just getting 12 hours sleep and we're like, okay, cool. And I was like, okay, well, we have to be over the top and protective of this. And then I finally went to the doctor and I was like, look, I think I'm getting a bit of anxiety over this. Like I think I'm getting anxiety from, you know, being obsessed. And then she was asking me the other questions like, you know, are you sad? I'm like, I'm not sad. I'm the happiest I've ever been. I I don't think it's, you know, because she was hinting at postpartum depression. And she's like, well, I actually think you've got it, but you've got anxiety and OCD, like parts of it. So she's like, they can all kind of be an umbrella term for it all. So uh, I was like, okay, like I'm thinking at the same time, like I don't have that, but sure, we'll try what you think we need to try. Um, So she gave me Zoloft, I think it is, like the antidepressant. And she's like, look, it'll take six weeks to kick in. Um, But once it does, you know, you should start feeling a little bit more um, pre-baby you. And I was like, okay. And then it got to a stage where I think it was like five weeks after, I'm like, I actually feel like a completely different person like I just like I was never sad that's the thing I was never sad I was never unhappy I never you know I wasn't having moments of just crying it was just I felt overwhelmed and so anxious and I was obsessed with cleaning the house making sure this was clean making sure his clothes were on the right clothes rack like it was it was very looking back on it now I definitely had like a lot going on (laughs) Um, but now I'm just like, you know what? Our baby wakes up four times throughout the night now. And I'm like, it is what it is. I can't control it. Um, and it's just crazy how I just feel like I'm appreciating the journey a lot more and actually being present for it rather than when I look back on, you know, I guess three months, me, I just wasn't appreciating the whole journey because I was obsessing over things that really at the end of the day, I had no control over. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. And for you to have had the insight to think something's not right and to take yourself to the GP in the first place is amazing. Yeah, like as I said, I thought it was just anxiety and I'm like, I've never been anxious in my life, so something's up here. And then to be told it was postpartum depression, I was like, well, I'm not sad. And it just it didn't make sense to me because I'm like, postpartum depression to me is being sad or crying or overwhelmed in those areas. And I'm like, that's not me. (laughs) I was in denial until five weeks after. I was like, look, I'll give it a go. (laughs) And then when it all changed, I was like, that was probably the best decision for me. And now like, yeah, even my husband's like not getting, I guess, the crazy over obsessed wife that he had. (laughs) Yeah. Amazing. So you went to the doctor at about three months postpartum? No, it was, oh, I think four and a half months, four and a half close to five months. Okay. So So only. Yeah. yeah. So it's only one and a half months or so ago, two months ago. Yes. Yeah, Yeah. right. Oh, well, I'm so glad you're feeling better and you're feeling like a new person, so to speak. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) yeah. Must be a relief for you. It is because I think at the same time that's when Bub just stopped sleeping overnight and I know what two months ago me would have just thought that was the end of the world and I would have been just probably holed up in my house. (laughs) Yeah. And did the GP suggest anything else in addition to the Zoloft? Did she She have any me? Yeah, she did give me a list of psychologists, um, but she did give me the heads up as well. She's like, look, the waiting list for these are quite long, so you possibly might not get in until you're considered not postpartum anymore. Um, so basically I think after the 12 month mark, they consider you not postpartum. So she was like, look, you can either book in now, chat to them, see if anyone can fit you in, start the medication or you can do both. So I was like, okay, I'm going to try the medication and then I'll try and get into a psychologist as well. Um, and then I rang only probably two and it was the same thing. It was, they just weren't available anytime soon. And with Christmas, new year, I was like, look, I'll stop going. I'm not going to put this pressure on myself. Let's just keep with the meds, see what happens. And then I guess once that script finishes, go back to the GP (laughs) and have a chat again and see where we're up to there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's good. You got a bit of a plan then. 
oh, yeah, something. I've got a plan. <laughs> <laughs> Half a plan. Yeah. <laughs> so, Carissa, thank you. You've you've shared your journey with your fertility, being pregnant, your childbirth, your recovery and motherhood. You shared so much. Is there anything else? Is there anything you'd like to finish with for anyone who's listening today who perhaps pregnant, about to go through birth? My biggest advice is the mother community is a great community, but they are a very vocal community. And always do what you know is best for yourself. Like, you know, ask people for advice and their opinions. But at the end of the day, know that you're making your decision for yourself. And that's probably one of the hardest things I've had to learn. Like it's mother, the mother community, as I said, very vocal, very passionate, um, and you get positives and negatives with that. So just know at the end of the day you are the best decision for yourself. Mm, yeah, thank you. Carissa, for those who would like to come and connect, where can they come and find you? Um. Probably, well, I was just thinking then actually after you just asked me that question, um, either TikTok or Instagram. Instagram I basically share on stories, um, don't really upload too often, but then TikTok I just share probably more my journey and my finds, I guess, and it's just Carissa underscore McComb. <laughs> Brilliant, and I'll have all those links in the show notes. Thank you so much, Carissa, for taking the time out of your busy schedule motherhood (laughs) schedule to chat i really appreciate it no thank you for having me (laughs) okay we'll catch you soon all right thank you thanks for listening to the fitness mama podcast brought to you by the fitness mama freebies found at www.fitnessmama.com forward slash free So please take a few seconds to leave a review, subscribe so you don't miss an episode and be sure to take a screenshot of this podcast, upload it to your social media and tag me at Fitness Mama so I can give you a shout out too. Until next time, remember an active pregnancy, confident childbirth and strong postnatal recovery is something that you deserve. Remember our disclaimer, materials and contents in this podcast are intended as general information only and shouldn't substitute any medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. I'll see you soon.